the title seems very technical, QCD in finite volume. Um, let me motivate it first and then I'll give the outline. So um, let's take a motivation actually. So these lectures um, will only consider QCD, so the strong interactions. There will be no electroweak interactions, only strong decays, and we'll be considering hadrons. And um, so hadron will only decay strongly if it decays at all. So for a given channel, what is important is the, um, the location of a threshold. So um, um, a hadron can decay to two hadrons, um, H1, H2, if it is it has the same quantum numbers and it, if it is above this threshold. And these will be hadronic resonances. Okay. They are not eigenstates of QCD, and so they cannot be extracted in a simple manner. And they are most abundant states among hadrons. And that will be our primary interest here. Okay, then there are states that are well below threshold. They don't even feel the effect of threshold. They can be they are eigenstates of QCD, they can be extracted in the usual manner. You get an energy, this gives you the mass, that's it. Okay? And there is some states that are just slightly below threshold and they feel the effect of the threshold. And this will uh, call um, shallow bound states. Like for example, uh, deuteron is just below P and threshold. So it feels this threshold, it cannot be ignored the threshold or like, this X3872 is an interesting state which is just below this threshold and this state is just below this threshold. So these are examples of states that will be shallow bound states. And these also have to be treated in non-trivial way which we will discuss. Okay, um, well, uh, maybe I should mention, I will be assuming you are not doing this kind of studies for your uh, PhD, because if you're doing this kind of studies, you know a lot of this already, but you'll surely learn things even if you're doing this kind of studies, because I try to derive everything. So, okay. Um, so let's look at some hadrons, okay, with this flavor content. So the ones I encircle with uh, green, cannot decay strongly, like K meson cannot decay strongly. But you can see there is only little of them, okay? Most of them, like those encircled of yellow, they can decay strongly, they are resonances, they are not eigenstates of QCD, so you really may have to work hard to extract them from Franz principal lattice QCD and we'll try to learn how that does work. Okay, there is few, that are this shallow bound state, just below threshold. So for example, this scalar state is just below DK threshold and this one is just below DK, this threshold. Um, so this is our purpose. And so for resonances, which are the most abundant, this is a slide, uh, we'll go much deeper into that. Basically experiment have to look for resonances by doing scattering experiments like pi pi goes to pi pi. They measure the cross section and then from the bump, they extract the mass, and from the width, they extract the width. So basically, what the experiment does, it's scattering, and we'll have to do scattering on the lattice. So this would be probably more appropriate um, title of my lecture, scattering in lattice QCD. So this will be the game. So, but before I give even the outline, some motivation from experiment. And I pick up uh, some beautiful results from LHD experiment, which can be all uh, obtained from this slide. Uh, of course, other experiments have really nice results as well. Okay, for example, conventional charmonium resonance. It's charm, anti-charm. But if it is above TD bar threshold, it, it can decay in this way, okay? And that's what you see in experiment. You will find this bump that corresponds to this vector resonance. Last year, for the first time, the spin three state was discovered. That's this bump. It's 
uh, decaying like this, you can see this bump, it's three minus minus state. So all these states, you cannot, they are not the eigenstates of QCD, you have to study from scattering on the lattice. Okay. Um, some more conventional, so these were conventional before, now some more conventional states. For example, they have weird names, but never mind. Okay, suppose you have a charm strange strange baryon. By emitting a pair of U quarks, it will decay into K meson and this, what it's called, Xi. Never mind about these weird letters. Okay, so such states, such, such exotic, no, excited, sorry, not exotic, these are not exotic, excited omega sub C states. Um, um, should be seen as bumps in the invariant mass of this pair. So look at this beautiful results from LHCB experiment from 2017. This is invariant mass of this pair. Five beautiful resonance peaks. They are quite narrow, but this is strongly decaying resonances. Okay, conventional ones. Okay, some exotic states now. Everybody of you probably have seen the pentaquarks result. This is from last year of LHCb. So what's that? The, there is bumps in the invariant mass of J psi proton. So you have a proton UUT. You have J psi charm anti charm. So whatever decayed into this had to have five valence quarks. So it's called pentapark bump, okay? Uh, so this is also strongly decaying resonance. If you want to do something with exotic hadrons, you need to study this kind of scattering, okay? So um, another resonance. Um, this is the most recent, not the most recent, the most recent I'm not even presenting, quite recent from June. You see, this is a invariant mass of two J size. And you can see really structured bumps here. So there were some metastable states. Okay, you have J psi, J psi. They are broad, so that was a strong decay for sure. Whatever it was, it had to contain four quarks. It's called X960. So it's a resonance. Again, unfortunately, it doesn't decay it was seen in this decay, but unfortunately it ca can decay into other hadrons as well, strongly, and that's what makes it very difficult. And the last one that I'm presenting now, it's not from LATB, it's from Bess and Bell. It's um, the bump in J psi pion. Okay, so you have a J psi, charm anti charm, and a pion, charged pion. So whatever decayed into that had to have minimum four valence quarks. It's called a Z sub C bump. And another resonance. Um, yeah. Okay, now with this motivation, let me give the outline of the lectures. Um, so in the first lecture, so that means today, we will um, only uh, do scattering in the continuum. Sorry, no finite volume lattice uh, QCD, but I think, um, I mean, whatever we say, it will be crucial for, uh, for, for, for the lectures that will follow because we will learn how to extract shallow bound states, virtual bound states and resonances. How, I mean, on the lattice, we'll extract the scattering matrix. But then today we'll learn once you have a scattering matrix, how do you, how do you recognize that you have a shallow bound state, virtual bound state or a resonance? And what we'll also discuss is uh, a pose of the scattering matrix in the complex energy plane and stuff like that. Okay, next lecture, we'll go to finite volume and we'll learn or tell something how to extract eigenenergies of two hadron system in a finite volume that you probably know already. So I'll not 
spend too much time on that, but I'll tell you. The most important thing will be the derivation between the, of the Lucia relation, which relates this eigenenergy in the finite volume with the scattering matrix. So this will be a little bit painful derivation. Maybe you've seen the result, but we want to do the lecture. So let's try to at least give you a flavor of this derivation. In the lecture three, um, uh, we'll, I'll show some simple lattice examples of um, studies of bound states, virtual bound states and resonances. I'll try not to sh show too fancy studies because these are difficult to understand. And then lecture four, we'll see how far we go, but I'll try to discuss scattering of particles with spin. And at that point, we'll learn more about the construction of two hadron operators because then it becomes interesting. And we'll discuss couple channel scattering. But let's see how it goes. Um, yeah, so do we have some questions for now? No questions yet. Okay. Um, some disclaimer. I will, I will definitely not present the review of lattice simulations. I'll show specific results just as an example. So I'm taking this really hopefully as a lecture. And often I'll take less fancy analysis because sometimes it's more easy to understand uh, and this will be done for simplicity. Okay, but if you want an overview of the literature, you should consult papers or review papers. So here is some that I'm recommending. This is Relief for Lattice QCD about scattering is this review. It's really nice. This is the physics report and it contains a section on lattice results on exotic states. This is a section, uh, this Bell 2 book contains also a section about lattice results, which I actually watered. Um, and it's in chapter 14. Another recent review, of course, you can look at the proceedings of Lattice Conference in, well, in Wuhan or, <laughs> well, a place we now much more know about than uh, when we were in Wuhan, <laughs> but also other Lattice Conferences. Okay, so one, what do we want to learn today? And let's see how far we get. So our basic, object will be a scattering amplitude because as I said we need to study the scattering like in experiment. Um, we'll study shallow bound states, virtual bound state resonances. We will uh, ident we'll say how to identify those states once we have extracted teammate uh, scattering amplitude from lattice. We'll talk about poles in the scattering amplitude in the complex energy plane about the Riemann sheets. We'll talk about partial wave S mostly, but then also about higher partial waves. Uh, we'll discuss how we expect the scattering amplitude to behave near threshold, and we'll uh, present some simple examples in spherical well potential in quantum mechanics just to do some calculations. Okay. As you know, but uh, let's give this slide. Uh, conventional hadrons are baryons and mesons, while exotic are those that have minimal content of more than two valence quarks. So this will be tetra quarks, penta quarks, hybrid mesons containing Q, Q bar pair, and gluons. Of course, ev everything contains also uh, pairs of C, Q, Q, Q bar pairs and gluons. And let me say that basically all of the exotic hadrons that were discovered in experiment, there is plenty. They are all resonances or kind of shell of bound states. None of them is this state that is easy to extract on the lattice, unfortunately. Okay, so current status before we dwell into theory. So experiment discovered many exotic hadrons. Fortunately, none is easy to study on the lattice because it mostly has strong, several strong decay channels. And so there's a lot of effort still to do and a lot of challenging challenges in front of us. Okay, 
Some exotic hadrons were identified on the lattice. These ones, for example, containing two big quarks. Unfortunately, those are too hard for experiment. Uh, so, I mean, surely there will be progress in the field, and, but this just says that there is a lot of very interesting questions and experiment is providing beautiful results like every month or every few months. So yeah, a lot of problems to solve. Okay, now um, questions? No. Okay, finally, let's go to scattering um, now. In, well, first in non-relativistic quantum mechanics. I'm sure you've seen some of that in your courses, but I think, um, or even if you, in your research, but uh, this will be important for all uh, that follows. So, so, so let's try to do some derivations here still, or try to refresh our knowledge. Okay, non-relativistic quantum mechanics, we all know the Schrodinger equation, right? And then um, this is the solution, and this is um, the solution of the radial part. M will be the reduced mass. So scattering. Um, well, the scattering solution is the one that you have a plane wave, and then you have something outgoing, only outgoing. And th this is the way it looks for large R, okay? Um, the important point will be that this has an ingoing uh, and outgoing thing, but this uh, only has an outgoing one, okay? So this is pictorial. And uh, what experiment basically measures is how many particles one sees um, in a given, uh, how do you call this, angle, spherical angle, and this is given, of course, by this function. Okay, now for a moment or for some time, let's consider S wave, which is the easiest for derivations, but otherwise it's everything else is similar for higher partial waves. So an S wave, if you have a, this is a, an S wave means just that everything is radially symmetric. And actually S wave will be dominant if the wavelength is much bigger than the object. So if a wavelength is much bigger than this star here, uh, then S wave will be dominant. And that happens actually at low momenta. S wave is dominant. That's why we talk S wave first. Okay. So, um, so what is the solution of this Schrodinger equation? outside the region of potential. So suppose you have some potential like this. There is a, some potential and then it dies away after this point. The solution will be simple. The solution will be just a sine plus some phase, right? And that's this phase shift actually that will be very important for our lecture. It will be um, part of our lectures all, all the time. So the notion of a phase shift is just basically how much the wave function is shifted away uh, uh, in the region outside the potential, okay? And if there is no potential, of course, the phase shift is zero. This will be the solution because we have to, we have, to have zero here. Okay, now let's see. Um, this wave function in another way. It's a sinus. You can decompose the sinus in this way. And then you can pull out this factor. You pull out this prefactor and you get circle wave out and circle wave in. And there, there is this piece that, that basically turns out in front of this piece. This is actually the scattering matrix. Okay, this is telling you, um, well, if this, this is, if phase shift is zero, this will be one, this tells you that nothing actually happened. So this phase shift is telling you what, if something really happened, and it's basically um, the, the 
cross matrix between in plane wave and out state formally. Okay, so this S matrix um, is this. It has to be, um, since due to the conservation of probability, of course, um, you have to have that this times this dagger is equal to one. Um, because otherwise, from here, the probability will not be conserved. So basically, you can see this S matrix, since it has to satisfy this condition, just as a parameterization, general parameterization that will uh, conserve this condition. Okay. So is there some question here? Not yet. Okay. Um, yes, can I ask something real quick? Uh, hi, Leonardo here. This yeah? zero is just a um, uh, free parameter when integrating the differential equation, right? Uh, what is free parameter? Uh, the phase shift delta zero at first. It first turns up when you, have, you write u of r. So it's just a parameter. Mm -hmm. um, okay, you know, the solution outside the, when the potential is zero, you know it has to be sinus for S wave, right? Look at this, there is no, nothing here. It's a parameter, yes. Okay. But of course, how do you get this parameter? You um, basically, the way you do it, you, you solve the, the solution here, right? You have to do the solution here uh, in, in normal quantum mechanics is easy to get. You get a solution here, which is, let's see, do I have it on the next slide? No, I, at some point I have it, how to get the solution here. And then you just um, say that here the function and the, the derivative have to be continuous and you extract the phase shift if you have a potential, yeah? But okay. we want to do it non-perturbable tibling QFT, and then we will tell you next in the next lecture how to extract the phase shift. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So, uh, what well, phase shift? If you have a potential, you have to solve this equation here. You match it here, and you get the phase shift. And at some point in the later in the slides, I'll tell you how to solve the equation. With Mathematica, it's very simple. You use and dissolve and it spits out the solution. Um, okay. Now, suppose we did, we did solve for this phase shift in quantum mechanics. What is this function f? How do we extract it? Well, um, on one hand, we know that the solution should be like this, plane wave plus, plus outgoing wave. On the other hand, we know it is like this, outside the region of potential. And just by comparing this one and this one, um, you can extract this thing here. I'll not do it, probably you did it in some quantum mechanics course, but this is what tells you what will be coming out in terms of the phase shift, okay? And simple exercise if you want to do F. Okay, so let's rewrite this on the next slide. This F now is on this slide here, basically gives you uh, what is coming out, the amplitude of what is coming out. Now let's rewrite it a little bit differently. This F, let's pull out this, this factor here. Pull out this factor here and turn the equation around. Okay, pull out this here, you'll get one plus two IPF. Okay, this comes to this. Okay, now let's a, bit, a little bit rethink. This is nothing but a scattering matrix. And on the other hand, you write it typically the scattering matrix is identity, means nothing happens, plus something happens. And you can use some normalization here. Let's use this normalization here. And so this T matrix T, T is telling you what really happens. So in this sense, basically you find that this T, it's a scattering amplitude, is nothing but this, but this F that uh, we extracted. 
Okay, you can use different normalizations for this scattering amplitude, but basically that the scattering amplitude is telling you how much it will be going out. It's just nothing but, but this F, which was written here. So now T will be the scattering amplitude. T will be the basic object of this course. So we know now this T is like this, it's F. It's basically given by the phase shift, of course. And there is three ways of writing it. You can trivially see that either you can write it like it's proportional to sinus delta, or it's trivial to see that also it's one over cotangent delta minus i. You can check this. Maybe you're not used to this form, but this is the most practical for lattice studies somehow. So in the end, the, 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 the thing we want to really remember is that the scattering amplitude in terms of phase shift is expressed like this, and that's what we'll be using. But maybe you're familiar with other forms. Okay, um, so we have, if you have a phase shift and P is the momentum of a particle in the region outside of the potential, then you have a scattering amplitude and you know that then the cross section will be proportional to this. And basically you can tell experimentalists what one can expect. Is there an, a question here? No? Okay, now let's go uh, to some simple examples. First we'll do a bound state, then we'll do a virtual bound state, and then we'll do a resonance. Um, resonance, although it's perhaps the most important, comes in the end because, um, yeah, never mind, it will come. Okay, now I try to go to um, my iPad, let's see, because otherwise, what's happening? Stop share. Now let's see if it works. Uh, iPad via cable. Let's see. Okay, let's see how that works. Okay, this will be a simple example, but what we want to actually, so you can see my screen, I guess, right? Yeah. Um, so the one you can work out like in 10 minutes by yourself as well, that's why I'm taking it, but it's, so let's consider the case where we really have a, a pot, uh, in three dimensions, poten attractive potential led, um, for, um, build for uh, small distances and no potential for large distances. And first let's consider if you have a bound state, okay? What we really want to show now, um, besides what you already probably know, is that that actually at the position of a bound state, that's at this energy, the scattering matrix has a pole. That maybe you have not heard yet, but that's how lattice simulations actually look for these bound states. If they are just below threshold, that's the way you have to look for them. Okay, so that's what we want to show. But let's start with the basics. Okay, so, so um, in this case, um, what do we have? Here we have, um, uh, well, energy is, uh, sorry, no, okay, I need to get used to this a little bit. So energy is P squared over 2M, okay, uh, in the region outside the potential. And then energy is negative, of course, for a bound state. So you can think of a momentum that is imaginary. Okay, so momentum is imaginary. It can be negative or positive imaginary, but for a bound state, it is positive imaginary. Positive imaginary, that means that uh, the uh, wave function really falls exponentially here. So basically this means that um, this E, P, R will uh, fall exponentially, okay? So 
um, to find the energy of a bound state, that's simple, but let's, let's do it. So basically we have the function here, it's uh, B minus PR, okay? That's, and then here in this region, we have, this is a momentum Q. This will be the U is A sinus QR. And Q and P are related um, simply. So uh, we know that Q will be here. Um, well, that, that is, you know, just look at this and you'll see it's there. Uh, there is, there is a relation between P and Q and the size of a potential. Okay. Now uh, let's see uh, what is the by uh, the energy of a bound state in a, that's a real basic quantum mechanics. You just want to make a wave function continuous at, at this boundary. So basically that means that uh, A sinus QR will be equal to B minus PR, okay? And then the derivative has to be um, continuous as well, okay? That you, you make a derivative of this and it's, uh, you'll get cosine QR times, I guess, Q. And here you make B E minus P R times minus P. Okay. So out of these two equations, if you divide those, you'll get simply that tangens Q R times Q is minus p sorry um one over q is minus one over p um yeah so from this you can get actually this momentum and the energy okay and then important physical example, let's discuss it just to have something in mind. Let me see what are the numbers here. Of course, a deuteron, right? What else? That's probably the most important bound state. Um, let me see. Aha. Okay, if um, for the deuteron, uh, then um, radius is two femtometer. Um, the potential is 36 MeV. And you know how much will be the binding energy? Anybody knows by heart? Hmm? No? 2 MeV. 2 MeV, yes. It will be 2 MeV. Okay. So um, this is the binding energy. Um, and yeah, that's it. Now uh, we want to show, okay, we didn't see nothing about scattering here. Now um, uh, we want to show that at this energy, the scattering amplitude has a pole. It's infinite. Okay. So um, yeah, let's, let's do it. Now let's go for scattering. Scattering. Well, scattering formally happens at positive energies, not at negative. Now, so let's consider positive energy. Now, this is the picture for scattering. If you have a positive energy here, you have uh, some sinus or cosine here for small r and some other sign for large r. So um, let's try to derive what is the phase shift in this case and what is the scattering amplitude, okay? So, um, so we have a U again here will be some B times sine P 
uh, plus delta. This is this phase shift we want to determine. And here u will be a times, here it has to be just sinus qr. Okay, because uh, it, yeah, that's it. Now let's determine the phase shift. This we want to determine. Well, uh, it's just the same as before. We want that uh, the wave function is continuous and it's derivative at r. Okay. So, uh, now, unfortunately, this goes out of the screen. No, let's let's have it here still. Okay. So. So at r equal to r. This is all on the slides. A little bit more nicely written, I'm sorry. <laughs> Here it's not very nice. So it's basically um, a sinus qr is equal to b sinus pr plus delta. Okay? And the derivative. No, a cosine qr times um, Q is B cosine PR plus delta times P. Okay, now divide both equations like before and <clears throat> we'll get tangens QR one over Q is equal to tangens um, PR plus delta what, times one over P. Okay. And so, well, for given momentum or energy, right? You know, for given momentum or energy, you get the Q from the potential and then from this equation, you get the phase shift. Okay. Um, you just turn it around, extract this phase shift, and you have explicit expression, which is very easy to play with. Okay, so I'm going to back to the slides now. Um, yeah. Okay. Let me turn this off. Oh, sorry, was there some question here with these derivations? No? Okay, so you have, um, so from this equation, you just extract the phase shift and that's very nice expression, easy, right? You get the phase shift as a function of P or as, as a function of energy. Okay, now we have this and we can plot the scattering matrix because we know how scattering amplitude is extra, um, 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 obtained, we learned from phase shift. It's energy dependent, of course, and that's the main goal here, to extract the energy dependence from lattice in later lectures. Okay, so is, if you stick out, stick in this potential for deuteron and then the radius, well, uh, uh, if you stick this in, for positive energies, that will be the dependence. Okay, nothing particularly. But, but okay, you can, for positive energy, extract the scattering amplitude. Now, what we want to show, what happens at this negative energy, okay? Okay, if you do it also for negative energy, it's no problem. What you'll find that for negative energy, the scattering amplitude has a pole here, exactly at minus two MeV that we obtained as a bound state. So from this example, you can already see that the scattering amplitude has a pole at the position of the bound state. And from lattice, it turns out you can extract the scattering amplitude from for real energies above threshold and also somewhat below threshold. So the idea is to extract scattering amplitude from lattice and look where it's, there is a pole. So pictorially, there will be a pole in the scattering amplitude below threshold 
And if it is a bound state, it will happen for positive imaginary room momenta. I will call this Riemann sheet one. We'll talk more about Riemann sheets later. But if it's positive imaginary momentum, I'll call it Riemann sheet one. Um, to be honest, how on the lattice people actually do it, it's a little bit different. I mean, not different. It's just, let, let's see how they do it on the lattice or we do it on the lattice. So this is the scattering amplitude. You've probably seen now that five times, okay? So when, um, where is the pole of this? When this is equal to this. So basically what we do is extract from the lattice P cotangent delta. This we can extract using the Lusher formalism, which I'll explain next time. So we extract this. Um, and plot it. So, so P cotangent delta, suppose on the lattice, you get this blue line. Suppose you, your data tells that P cotangent delta is this blue line, okay? And then you need to see where this is equal to IP below threshold. What is IP? IP, if P is I times P absolute, this is minus P. So basically this minus P is basically just the square root, this orange line, if you plot it in terms of energy. So what you see where these two lines cross, where P cotangent delta crosses IP, right? Well, in our example, it crosses here. It crosses at minus two MeV, right? And that would, uh, this crossing would give you the position of bound state. Some questions? No. Okay. Um, so another comment on a bound state in quantum mechanics, we said that the wave function will be of this form, sinus PR plus delta. Okay. And you can express this as an outgoing piece and ingoing piece. And if you factor appropriate piece out, you'll get this, this combination. Okay. Now, a bound state, you know that in the range outside of the potential, it has to be exponentially falling, right? So if momenta is imaginary in this sense, this will be exponentially falling while this will be exponentially rising. And you want to have for a bound state only exponentially falling piece. So the only way to get rid of this piece is to have this infinite. So this has to be infinite. And so we see another way that at the position of the bound state, the scattering matrix, which is nothing like, uh, it's just this, is should be infinite. So this will ensure that you only have the exponentially falling part. So it's another way to see that the position of bound state, the scattering matrix has a pole. What about in QFT? Actually, this is a bit easier to see in QFT. <laughs> so if you have a bound state forming, if you have some scattering, the propagator will be for this a bound state will be like this. So you see that the position of a bound state, the scattering matrix will be infinite. And that's the way we'll look for bound states in the lattice. Um, okay. Now, um, you've not heard much about virtual bound states. There are not many, but okay, let's talk about them as well. Suppose you have uh, not a proton neutron in the deuteron channel. Deuteron channel has spin one. Suppose you have a proton neutron, proton, proton, neutron, neutron in a spin zero channel. You, you know there is no bound state there, right? But what is there? In this case, um, you can think of a, a slightly weaker potential. It's, it was 36 for neutron, now it's 23, uh, experimentally. <laughs> experimentally, as long as experiment can measure this. And then uh, the, the, you can think of, uh, it's, uh, it has a radius two femtometer. And then if you do this um, 
exercise with square well potential, um, you'll get the, the scattering matrix. Well, that's what you get. It takes you like probably 10 minutes to actually do it. Since you have a phase shift, right? We calculated the phase shift. The phase shift is given here. From this phase shift, you can calculate now everything. Okay. You see that the scattering matrix has a pole at about 160 kV below threshold. Is this a bound state? Do they, these things form a bound state? Um, well, it turns out if you look at whether the pole happens for positive or negative imaginary momenta, it turns out, if you look closely, it happens for negative imaginary momenta, not for positive as for bound state. So this pole happens for negative imaginary momenta. It's not a really bound state. It's not falling exponentially. It's actually rising exponentially. It's not a real state, uh, somehow um, a new state. Um, but there is a pole in a scattering matrix. And we say that this is related to a virtual bound state. It's not really a state, but it is, there is a pole in scattering matrix. Um, in analogous way, how you would recognize it from the lattice. Um, so basically, you look at the position where this is equal to this, then there you have a pole. This you can extract from lattice, suppose you get this blue line. If you were studying this with physical quark masses, you should have the blue line kind of, okay? And then you look where it crosses this IP, which IP, uh, P is now negative imaginary. And it crosses here, it crosses at minus 160 kV. And so you, you would say this is a virtual bound state. Um, <laughs> I mean, what does an experiment care about virtual bound state? One cannot uh, do experiment at negative energy anyway. So let's see, say, tell what is an effect of a virtual bound state for experiment. And then we, I guess, make a break. Excuse me, can I make a question, please? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I probably didn't fully understand what's uh, the difference between a, a true bound state and a virtual yeah. bound state. So, yeah. As far as I understood, uh, the, the main difference from a uh, I mean, from a theoretical point of view, is that the, the pole, of course, for negative imaginary uh, momenta instead of positive, uh, right? Yeah. This is basically the only uh, difference. You, if you, I mean, if you do this simple calculation, and if you um, plot this, right, and this, well, well, give, let me answer this way. Energy is P squared over 2M. And if, if energy is negative, which is in both cases for real bound state or virtual bound state, you have two possibilities to get the P, right? To, this, to get this negative energy plus or minus, right? Yes. And for a real bound state, it turns that the pole happens at P is plus I times something positive. And for a virtual bound state, this only happens, the pole happens for minus, um, for negative imaginary, right? Okay. Um, I mean, you see, um, le let me give it the different. Uh, so, so in this case, you see P cotangent delta, which is basically to those who know this uh, thing is uh, basically scattering length. Scattering length here, P cotangent delta is negative. And for, a, in case of a negative scattering length, this can cross here and you get a bound state, right? Um, but, but you understand the, uh, the meaning of this uh, orange curve, hopefully. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. This is, uh, as a function of energy, you want to plot IP, and, and in this case, it's minus P, right? 
Now here, okay. Now here you have a, suppose in this channel, if you, you do the simulation right, you should get positive picotangent delta. There is no way that this could cross on the negative side this square root of P or energy. This could not. This can only cross here and that happens then when um, P is negative imaginary. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Is that answering your question? Yes, yeah. but um, it, to me, it is not clear what's the difference from a, I mean, from a physical point of view. The yeah, it's states, quite uh, a big difference because you see, if um, uh, because um, because um, well, uh, for a bound state, it goes like maybe I should uh, share now um, the. Um, Stop share this and share a whiteboard, let's say. Share. Okay, um, so E, E, P, R. Okay, so oh, that, that looks terrible. Okay, I should do another. So if P, this is outside the region of potential, right? If this is like this times something positive, this will be really exponentially falling. It's a normalizable wave function, right? It's a bound state. You can call it a really eigenstate. It counts as an additional state in the spectrum, like hydrogen or whatever, right? Now, this you have not heard of for uh, uh, if, uh, this one. For a virtual bound state, it's like this, right? So this will be, okay, I'll never use this table again, sorry. Uh, this will be then, you can, if you pull this out in here, this will be exponentially rising thing. So this is not a, norm a normalizable state in quantum mechanics. It's not a really state, but, but, but it affects the scattering. And that was what I wanted actually to say. The scattering amplitude has a pole, and it has observable consequences for experiment. Maybe I should uh, just uh, say this. Maybe it will be clearer because in we care about experiments in the end. Okay. Okay. So what does experiment care? In both cases, we have a pole of a scattering matrix below threshold. Okay. So how can experiment see that something is going on? Uh, experiment can only uh, probe energies above threshold. Okay, so experiment measures the rate, which is proportional to cross sections times the current. So, and the current is proportional to p, and the cross section is proportional to t squared. So, experiment measures something p times t squared. So, for these two cases, since I have t, I can plot it. For positive energy, the experiment can probe, and you can see that for a example of a deuteron, you see that there is a sharp increase of a rate um, due to the presence of a deuteron. Well, deuteron can be observed as well because it's a real state. But then you can also see from experiment the sharp increase of the cross section. Also in case of uh, this virtual bound state, there is a virtual bound state pole that you see, really gives a very sharp increase of a cross section just above threshold. It's a peak, and peak are usually related to a state. And experiment would say, or a theorist would say, that this peak is related to the virtual bound state pole, although virtual bound state is not really normalizable. Okay, um, I think we can make five minute break or three minute break here, just. Um, if, if you're fine with that, uh, is there some, um, um, no, actually, just before we do that, actually, there is another slide and then we go to other topics. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, uh, just as a summary of what I said, okay? So how do we search for shallow bound state or virtual bound state, okay? What we do, we extract scattering, we'll extract scattering matrix from the lattice. And then scattering matrix on the lattice can be only extracted for real energies, to be honest. Um, above, 
threshold and somewhat below. Experiment can only extract scattering above threshold, of course. Okay. And then we'll say if there, that there is a bound state, if we find a, a pole in a scattering matrix below threshold, uh, um, um, for momenta, positive imaginary momenta, we'll call it on Riemann sheet one, and I'll discuss Riemann sheets after the break. We'll say we have a virtual bound state if um, we find a pole for a negative imaginary momenta, we'll call it on Riemann sheet two. Okay, that's the, the, the summary. Then now we go to the Riemann sheets before resonances. Is there some questions still before? Uh, I have a question, please. I'm Lorenzo. Okay, hi. Uh, so in the previous slide, I, I just, I, I'm not sure that I understood correctly, but basically uh, here, yes. So like, uh, that means that the, the effect of the virtual bound states can also be seen basically experimentally in the scattering. Well, in, in the scattering. Yes, this is, um, you see, experiment measures bound, right? And yes. experiment will say, oh, maybe we have a resonance here. <laughs> But there is no resonance pole, really, right? Yeah. Uh, actually, for example, some, uh, so experiment, I mean, if one does the neutral, neutral scattering, see the bump. There is no resonance. This pole, uh, so this bump is related to uh, a pole of a scattering matrix that is below threshold, if that replies your question. Yes, yes, okay. Yeah. So, in actually, in the theory, what we always say, a bump should, is pro, uh, should be related to, to some pole. Okay, pole in the scattering matrix. And a pole can be either from a bound state or a virtual bound state or from a resonance. And that's what we are trying to learn today, right? Not every bump is a resonance. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay, so I, um, is three minutes enough? because we, we want to finish something before 12 still, so yeah. Yeah? Okay, let's meet in three minutes.
Okay? So maybe uh, we can continue now. Um, before we go to resonances, I would like to make an intermezzo. Um, because it turns out that the resonances correspond to poles of scattering matrix in away from real energy. So let's do this intermezzo a few slides before we go to resonances. Okay. It will be about three man sheets and how we go to look for poles in complex energy plane. Okay, so, well, in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, we have this relation between energy and momentum. In relativistic, that's it, okay? So now if you give, if you have a specific energy, how do you get a momentum? In this case, you, it's plus or minus this. In this case, it's plus or minus this. The problem is that the square root is a multivalued function. You have two solutions. Because if you square this, you, I mean, from this moment, either plus or minus, you'll get the same energy. Okay, that's the whole business of these Riemann sheets. So you have two possibilities for momentum. So far, we considered only real energies. And of course, the momentum could be for negative energies, could be plus or minus imaginary. But now it turns out it's good to not only consider real energies, but consider complex energies because uh, resonance will not have poles for real energies. They will have poles for complex energies. Okay. So suppose energy is now complex or this energy is complex. How do you get momenta from those? Yeah, using same equations. But you have two solutions, two possibilities, plus or minus. And there is this uh, simple definition which tells you uh, which solution you're using. Uh, if you use solution where the imaginary part of momenta is bigger than zero, you say, I'm on Riemann sheet one, physical Riemann sheet. Never mind about the names, physical or unphysical. If you're using a solution where imaginary momentum is negative, then you say, I'm on Riemann sheet two, it's, un it's unphysical again, don't mind about it. So in some sense, uh, the bound state is on Riemann sheet one, the virtual bound state is on Riemann sheet two. Okay, that's the definition of the Riemann sheets. Now let's uh, have some pictures, okay? So suppose you're in non-relativistic case, 2m is equal to one, suppose, and then momentum is just plus minus square root of energy. Now let's try to plot this momentum in complex energy plane. So you have now here a real energy and imaginary energy, if you want to do it in complex energy plane. And what I'm plotting here is now in, uh, in imaginary part of momentum and real part of the momentum. Okay, so imaginary part of momentum, you have always two solutions, plus or minus, right? And if imaginary part is positive, you are on Riemann sheet one, which I color by red. If imaginary part is negative, then you're on Riemann sheet two, I'm coloring it violet. While for real part of energy, this is how, um, again, the Riemann sheets are, um, the Riemann sheet one is red and the, the other one is violet, okay. Um, yeah, now let's see. Um, we said, that the bound state pole is a pole on the real axis at n negative energy on the Riemann sheet one. So I, on the Riemann sheet one, which is red, 
So a pole here kind of. It's below threshold on the real axis on the Riemann sheet one. This is this circle. Okay. Um, well, the physical scattering in experiment is done above threshold. Um, by definition, we call this Riemann sheet one above threshold on this axis, okay? Somewhat on this side, okay? So this is what experiment really explores. This is what experiment is. So a pole here would, if it's close, could affect the scattering in experiment on this green line. Okay, virtual bound state. It's on second sheet on the real axis below threshold. And if it's close to threshold, it can affect the scattering on in experiment. And they are picturely given here as well. Okay, what about resonances? We will see, we have not talked about resonances yet, but we will see that the resonances correspond to poles of the scattering matrix away from the real axis on Riemann sheet two. So a pole here, you see, ab it is above threshold, can affect the scattering on the physical axis, which is explored on experiment. Uh, you see that it is smoothly connected to the physical axis. You see, from here, where is the pole? You have a smooth connection up here, you see? And also here, it's a smooth connection, this Riemann sheet two is smoothly connected whatever, to whatever experiment explores on the physical axis here on the green line. This is not also important perhaps for you. So if you didn't follow this, it's not so crucial. Uh, I'll emphasize the important points when we get to examples of scattering. This might be a little bit weird to you, but okay, that's what is always used in papers for scattering are very often. So that's why I wanted to explain it. Okay, a last comment on this intermittent. So uh, the scattering matrix, as we said, is like this. Um, now, now you have this part and it turns out that this part is only a function of energy. It's not a function of square root of energy, right? So there is no sign in ambiguity. I'm not proving for it to you, but this one is the same on both Riemann sheets. There is no sign in ambiguity. So this one is the same on both Riemann sheets, right? Um, if you want to continue this quantity to the complex plane, you just replace E by complex E naively, and that's it for our purposes, that's enough. Well, this part is a momentum. So this is definitely momentum is square root of energy. So there is a sign ambigu uh, ambiguity. And here, this one, um, if imaginary P is bigger than zero, you see you're on sheet one. If imaginary P is uh, smaller than zero, you're on sheet two. So this part depends on which sheet you are. So you can have a pole of the scattering matrix on one sheet and not in the other sheet. That's how we say. Okay, then we go to the resonances. There are some questions here. No? Okay. If that seemed a little bit perhaps not so familiar to you, maybe the resonances will be a little bit more familiar. But okay, I have 15 minutes. I'd still perhaps do it on iPad. Uh, I hope I, I just, because if you're only watching all this that has been already written, maybe you get bored. So let's try it with the iPad. Um, Maybe we have just enough time to do it. So let me share my iPad. Mm -hmm. Sasha, sorry, I would have a question on uh, resonances and on poles. 
mm -hmm. on slide 34, if we can go back. Now I cannot, sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, can yeah. I uh, give you later? Yeah, yeah, we, we are both in Ljubljana, right? Yeah, yeah, so. And I, I, I will not be able to finish now if I, okay. yeah. I will ask okay. you afterwards. Yeah, because, uh, well, now I just turned on the iPad. Okay. Yeah. Usha is in Ljubljana, so that's not going to be a problem to answer her. What's happening here? Okay. No resonances. I'm sure you heard about resonances, but let, uh, let's, um, let's repeat the main stuff. Um, and how do we search for them on the lattice? Okay, the strategies. Okay, so the scattering matrix is the same as before. Depends on the phase shift. Well, if you have a S wave, how can you get even a resonance? It, uh, just a comment, it's not enough if you have only attraction, you need also some repulsion to keep it together from falling apart. Because if you only have attraction for positive energy, it will not make a resonance. That's just a side comment. Um, okay, so. So, let's see. T, T is then proportional to uh, cotangent square delta plus one. So the, the, this will have a maximum when cotangent delta is one. Oh, sorry, when cotangent delta is zero, okay? So the scattering matrix will have a maximum when cotangent delta is equal to zero. Well, and then phase shift is 90 or pi half, whatever you like it. So that's a resonance phase shift. Um, now, one parameterizes the dependence of a phase shift in the vicinity of the resonance phase shift. So one uses a simple parameterization. Well, um, cotangent delta in, in, in vicinity, you use usually two parameters. Okay, the first parameter is MR, and it is where actually at the energy, at the energy when the phase shift is a resonance phase shift. So this corresponds to resonance phase shift. Okay, that will be the resonance pass. The other parameter is, it, is the width. It tells you how quickly it goes through zero. Okay, so the slope is parameterized by the width. Okay. And um, you see that I put the falling function with energy increasing. So if the energy increasing is increasing, the cotangent delta is decreasing this corresponds to increasing phase shift with uh, decreasing energy. Okay, so this is a simple parameterization. And what will be the, what will be the phase shift dependence? You've seen that for sure. Sorry for my, my the pictures are nicer in the slides. Okay, and the resonance energy the phase shift will be 90, okay? And of course it will be increasing, something like this you'll get. So that's the phase shift dependence as a function of energy for a resonance. Okay, what's the scattering amplitude? Um, if you put this into this equation, okay, then, you just put this in and you'll get the bright figure form, which we'll be of course using a lot. You pull this in and you'll get m r squared minus e squared minus i e gamma e gamma. Maybe let's circle um, this because it's uh, important. Okay, and 
as you, uh, we've already plotted this, but this has a typical dependence. So in terms of energy, if you plot the T squared, you have a maximum at the resonance mass, and then you'll have falling around, and this will be related to the wave. Okay, so this is the bright Wigner. It's just a simple linear parametrization of the phase shift around. Okay, now uh, what is the most important quantity that is actually used in the lattice simulations to identify the resonance? Okay, in the lattice simulations, uh, let me, uh, so what we usually do is as follows. We know that the, the width is proportional to, to the phase space. And the phase space is like this for partial wave L. So basically, and um, the width is also proportional to the coupling of a resonance to two hadrons. That one is falling into hadrons. So we define a coupling here, which one is looking for. So we, we say that, well, we say, or even in phenomenology, definitely you can say that the width is proportional to this coupling to the phase space um, over like this. So you can always write the width is like this, okay? And let's now insert this to this equation. Uh, where do we want to insert it? To this equation. Sorry, um, cotangent delta, this one. Let me see if I can do it. I'm trying, oh, sorry. Okay, I have, let's try to copy. Okay. I'm not very skillful with this, sorry. Insert, sorry. Paste. Okay, now we have this equation here. Now I'm inserting this width to this equation. Draw. Okay, let, let's do the algebra because this will be very important for, for all resonance studies. So. I'm inserting this width in here. So cotangent delta is mr minus e squared over, now I'm putting this in the coupling. Now this is for general partial wave actually. Okay. So in case of a resonance, you expect, expect this the, uh, dependence. Now uh, let me pull these two to the left. So basically what we have is this I'll put to the left. So P2L plus one times cotangent delta over the energy. And what remains on the right hand side is M R minus E squared over G squared. Let me circle this. Uh, get used to writing on this. Okay, so for a resonance, you expect that the, uh, that this kind of behavior, this quantity should kind of be falling, and so what does one expect? So let's me uh, let me draw a diagram. So in, so, so in terms of energy squared, suppose you, you are able to extract from the lattice this quantity on the left. And one can do that You're using the Lucia formalism that I will explain. It takes, this is not easy to get, you, you, this takes well, on the order of a year typically. Okay, after a lot of effort, your lattice data says that this quantity, which is P to L 
plus 1 times cotangent delta over E is falling like this, almost on a straight line. That's what you extract from a lattice simulation. But you know that for a resonance, this should be equal to the right-hand side. So it crosses 0 at the energy, which is equal to resonance mass. So here, uh -huh, from the zero crossing, you'll get the mass over resonance. And the, from the slope, so crossing with zero, you'll get resonance mass. From the slope, you'll get the g and the, the width. OK, so this is um, the idea how to extract the resonance from a lattice simulation after you're able to extract this quantity. Um, okay. Is there a question here? I need to like five, four minutes more to show, to tell you about the pole. Uh, I, I would like to ask one question. Yeah. So in this equation, so we have the different dimensional quantities. Oh, so on what scale they are canceled, let's say? Because like P is in some crazy power. Oh, G, uh, well, you can work out uh, G is not always dimensionless. So uh, G, you mean uh, dimension in terms of, uh, so G yeah. for P wave would be, So I'm not saying that G is without any dimension. For every wave, you, you should work out what is the dimension of G. OK, is that the question? Yeah, yeah, now I understood. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, for different partial waves, uh, G uh, will, uh, the dimension of G will be different. Yeah, of this coupling. But that's already uh, apparent from this, right? Okay, if that answers the question. Okay, the last thing you, we want to do now, today, I guess, is to see what about the pole? Where uh, does uh, this um, reach the pole? Okay, so pole. Poles. So can I go three minutes over or is that the problem? Because it would be good to finish this one. It's really three minutes only. Is it fine? Hopefully. Yes, please. Anyway, we yeah. started with, uh, with two or three minutes. Yeah. Delay, so yeah. OK. Please. So let's see if the scattering matrix has a pole. OK. On the real energy, it doesn't have a pole, you see. It's always finite. So for real energy, obviously, it doesn't have a pole. Uh, so I can write not for real energy. So we have to wonder in the complex plane for which complex energy it has a pole. Okay, now we take this equation. Okay, let's try to re remember it by heart. This one that is encircled in, um, in um, green. It has a pole when the denominator is zero. Okay, so denominator equal be in zero is like this. Denominator is m r squared minus e squared um, minus e, e gamma. Where is this zero? Okay, this is the square equation. This is really easy to solve. Um, Okay, so let's see. So it is the pole happens at this will be minus b minus four ac. Sorry for my bad writing. It's like the pole is at this position. Okay, so it's obviously at complex energy. Okay, usually one uh, makes this approximation that this is smaller than mass, it's not important, but then simply the pole, you can see it happens at this position. If you take the 
the, the class value, the pole is at this position. Okay, so pole happens. Let's read, uh, let, let's um, draw it. This is the real energy. This is imaginary energy. This is the threshold. The pole happens somewhere here. This is the mass. And this is, this I'm sure you've seen already, but okay. So there is a pole of a scattering matrix. Now, uh, another one, uh, thing I just want to show to you, it's I want to show it this on which she did this lies because that's also important. I want to show you that this lies on sheet two. How do we decide this? We just need to determine uh, it's, whether it's on Riemann sheet two or one, just let's happen whether it happens for imaginary P bigger than zero or smaller than zero. This will tell us whether it's on sheet one or two. Now, um, let's see. Okay, the way, I, probably there is better way to do it, but the way I, I did it takes one minute and, okay, we know that T is like this. That we know by now. So, so the pole happens at IP is equal to cotangent delta times P. Okay, now this quantity, let's see how it, uh, it is with energy. This quantity with energy in, in, uh, for a resonance, it's falling with energy. So it's falling with P squared, okay? So this quantity will be something like this, where A and B are positive numbers, roughly, okay? Now you just have to work out at uh, what p it happens. So it's another square root equation. So b times p squared minus i plus i p minus a is equal to zero. Let's see the solution. p is minus i plus minus square root of whatever over two but this is real. So you see that the imaginary of P is negative. So this means that the pole is on a resonance sheet too. Um, yeah, so, okay, maybe let's write it down. Um, resonance, Um, corresponds to a pole yes. to a pole of scattering matrix of T of T um, on a second sheet on sheet two away from a real axis. Okay, I think, well, that's um, how far I, I got today. Uh, maybe, um, yeah, I don't want to prolong you, uh, prolong here. Um, yeah, I think that gave uh, you a basic, basic starting point for uh, scattering, for bound state virtual bound state resonances and we can uh, shortly go to finite volume next week. So is there some questions? Yes, uh, yes. if you can hear me. Yes, on, sure. On slide 36, when you introduced this right Wigner par parameterization, uh, I didn't quite get where that dependence of P to the two L plus one uh, of the width on the partial waves, where that came from. Ah. That I didn't derive, sorry, yeah. Um, this one. Um, I don't know by heart how I would even... Um, 
Ja. To be honest, um, the face space is supposed to be um, proportional to this, but to be honest, I don't know by heart how to derive this now. <laughs> so I thought it for granted, but uh, there should be a way to see it. Maybe I, I can think uh, till the next time about this. Um, Thanks a lot. Uh, well, I mean, there should be an easier way than this, but um, okay, uh, suppose you have a vector resonance. Uh, so suppose that uh, the particles in the, the final state are without spin, okay? Um, so for example, pseudo scalars, and then you have a scalar resonance or a vector resonance or a tensor resonance. This will correspond to different way, partial waves, right? And then, uh, then of course, you have to, there will be different ten structures, Lorentz structures entering into this vertex. So I guess this would be one way of seeing that the S wave uh, would be proportional to just P, uh, P wave will be proportional to P to the five. Um, yeah, but by uh, for I well by by heart I I don't know the derivation. Sorry. And another question. Um, yeah. Is the uh, par parameterization of the cotangent just like em like empirical, or does that or did that come from? Yeah, I, I, the, the way I wanted to sell this, it's quite empirical, right? Right, you, you, you know that the resonance parameter uh, comes from uh, where uh, um, this is equal to zero, yes? And then it has to cross zero, then you parameterize it linearly, but it doesn't have to be linear um, uh, away from resonance, right? There is no, to my knowledge, is no reason why this really has to be a straight line. It will be in the Taylor expansion, it will be straight line uh, very close here, right? But uh, away from it doesn't have to be. That's my understanding, at least. So it's it's the way I try to derive it. It's just that it's a Taylor expansion near crossing. Okay. All right, thank uh, you. But maybe uh, somebody else has a more rigorous view on this. But I think it's just a parametrization and doesn't have to work away from the the resonance. And it will work better for narrow resonances, obviously, because then this will be in a narrow, narrower range. Um, sorry, I have a last question. Uh, maybe I uh, slip apart, but uh, I didn't quite understand uh, the in the last slide um, when you wrote that uh, p cotangent delta is equal to a minus uh, ah, p, mm -hmm. Here. p squared. Mm -hmm. Yes. OK, Sorry. that was, maybe there is a better way. OK, that's the way I found uh, today. So you see, this quantity for a resonance, let's see what it is. Uh, this quantity, it will be just, it's falling, okay, with energy. Let me see. Ah, why did I put a P squared? That's actually a good question now. Okay, maybe that was not, um, um, okay, may, uh, you're right. Okay, so yeah, maybe that was naive. This quantity, it's falling with energy, but then this energy will be related to P squared. Yeah, okay. Okay, maybe I shouldn't have done it analytically. <laughs> okay, maybe it's P to the fourth here, then you cannot analytically solve it. Okay, L let me reply like this. Maybe that was not the best derivation. Okay. You have IP is equal to that. And this is equal to actually, if you're more appropriate to this parameterization here, okay? And then you look when, for what kind of momentum this is equal, okay? 
and the, I'm sure you will find that it will be equal um, if you, okay, if you solve for the momentum, the imaginary part of this momentum will be negative. That I'm sure, okay? Maybe this okay. derivation here was not really appropriate. Okay, uh, so you, you, just, you just have to plug that uh, parameterization of the yeah, yeah, cotangent yeah. delta inside. Yeah, yeah, okay. okay. Yeah, and it's, the, a, it's a good point. I thought it was, uh, actually, it would have to be p to the fourth here and then find the solution. But it, uh, the more proper way would be to plug this p cotangent delta. Cotangent delta is here. And then look for uh, what p, uh, there is a pole. And you'll definitely find that the imaginary of this p will be negative. But then you can do it with mathematica. It's not to solve here. Okay. And that and that is true for uh, each value of uh, of l, right? I, I mean the the yeah. exponent of yeah. P. This will be true for each value of l or the coupling. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I mean, uh, I should say okay. In any case that I. Uh, exp uh, for any uh, behavior of, of peak cotangent delta, that's what I found in my experience. And I studied many resonances. But actually, to do a general proof, I, I should probably look for a better general proof. This was not nice. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Uh, yeah, can I, can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, so uh, I I don't quite understood how um, how this is done on the on the lattice. So we try to get that linear plot that you showed before. Yeah, yeah, I have not explained. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, and uh, so. Um, yeah. Well, uh, just let me tell you that on uh, the lattice, um, we will try to extract the phase shift from the lattice for several energies. I will talk about that next time. And suppose then you get this red points here yes so what's the question uh yeah so um we need to get the f the phase shift from the lattice but uh i was wondering like how do, do i need like to compute to extract the energy levels or or something no but that is was not uh, sure uh, this will be the topic of next lecture we have four okay. lectures right sorry mm -hmm. no, uh no. that is uh, that i have not told you yet i will tell you that from the eigen energies so on the lattice you can compute eigen energies, and from each eigen energy you can compute the phase shift at that energy. Okay, so you can extract eigen energies, and then from this energy you get this phase shift. You get phase shifts for several energies. If you have several eigen energies, you get phase shift as a function of energy. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and then you get this point. But this, as I said, um, this lecture was still in the continuum. Next time we go to Lattice, we have three lectures uh, left. So we have still enough time to do that. Thanks. Uh, I also have a question that's more like a curiosity, basically. Yes. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to maybe grasp uh, a physical meaning of this uh, Riemann sheet, but maybe that's not the, how I should do this. I, we, I shouldn't search for a physical meaning of this, but if I understood correctly, so like the, the uh, both the virtual and uh, uh, the virtual pole and the resonance uh, pole, uh, lies in the lies in Riemann in what what we call Riemann sheet two. Yes. Am I, so, so maybe it's good to look at the, again at the resonance now that we talked about it. If you can give me a few seconds, right? Yeah, it will that, lie a pole on, yeah. on a uh, on a Riemann sheet two. Uh, it's a violet, right? It will be pole at this position of energy, and you can see that. The scattering matrix kind of here is smoothly connected to yes. the, to the uh, what happens in the physical scattering in experiment. So, and like, uh, uh, since I was searching for a physical meaning, it, it looks like the bound state is in Riemann sheet one. Yes. The physical one, but in the in the Riemann sheet two, there there are both and something that I will call the non-physical state. That are, it's the virtual one. 
and something that actually is a physical state that is a resonance so the diff yeah okay resonance is not an eigenstate it's yeah a, sure it's, uh, it's yeah, a meta stable yeah. state yeah yeah so, yeah okay. yeah sure so like yeah, it, that's true yeah i mean uh, maybe let's say that this virtual uh, bound state is a feature of a scattering not a, a, a normalizable eigenstate yeah, it's yes. a feature in the scattering that experiment can find uh, effects in the scattering okay but they are, uh, are like so the main difference between these two poles that stay that lies on riemann sheet two uh, is is basically that one is uh, smoothly connected and the other one is not i mean co smoothly connected you see um, yeah this one is above threshold away from the real axis and if there is a pole you can imagine that this pole will affect what happens here yes yeah okay now here we are on the real axis below threshold and if there is a pole not far below threshold it's far below threshold nobody will observe any effect but just slightly above tre below threshold then uh this it will, will affect, affect scattering saw, here. yeah 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 so okay so they can, of, of course okay i got it Thank yeah you. and for example uh for example one rather interesting state that is probably a virtual bound state is a uh, this severe resonance they observed a peak experimentally they say no okay this is a resonance but the theorists when they analyze the data they say oh the pole of this res uh, state is below threshold it's a virtual bound state not okay. the resonance so okay, okay. that's why i'm discussing all this sure okay? so if, if if they affects or not if they affect or not the the, um, the scattering function will depend not actually from where are in this Riemann sheet, but actually in, in or be better, even better, in which Riemann sheet they are, but actually the position in, in which they can they are in, inside the Riemann sheet. If they are, yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. See, um, if this one is below, uh, yeah, yeah, slightly yeah. below, it will affect. If it will be uh, far, be, far, far below, below the threshold, it will not yeah, cannot, yeah, yeah. and okay. also here like um if it's far away that means it's a uh, very broad yeah like if it's very broad because the further it goes it's uh, the larger the width if it's broad you know you'll b hardly see a bump in next yeah yeah the, the peak will be washed out yes okay yeah okay thank you